Interview with the artist Kate Lysett. Hello and welcome, Kate. Hello, Fiona. Tell us a little bit about you and your background and when you first started painting. I started painting professionally 10 years ago. Before that, I was a commercial textile designer. I worked in the industry for about nine years. I moved to Yorkshire 20 years ago for university. I studied textiles, so had to stay up north. I grew up in Suffolk before then. So 20 years in Suffolk and 20 years in Yorkshire. I studied in York and then I went down the industrial textiles route over in Huddersfield, which was all, you know, industrial knitting machines, industrial looms, proper serious stuff, less creative than at York. You're quite known for your landscapes and painting around Yorkshire. So tell us a little bit about that. It's so very different from Suffolk. And it was the surprise of that particularly the move to Coldsdale about 10 years ago, that changed the way I painted. The landscapes I found surprising and therefore very inspiring. Uh, The Hebden Bridge houses, the way they stack into the hillside, the colours, the skies, the rolling hills, the moorland, which I've actually only started to love over about the last year. I always found it very bleak before then. But, yeah, so... To me, it's changing all the time. My reaction to it is changing all the time, and more so than ever over the last 10 years since moving to Hebden Bridge. What's made you fall back in love with it? I joined the fell running group, and it's running over on the moorland. It's running in the heather. It's the light in the evening on the heather. And I used to think that they were just bleak and lifeless and dead, and now I think they're just incredibly beautiful. And I get the feeling... Like when you're little and you go to the seaside and you smell the sea for the first time and then your heart beats a little bit faster and now when I'm on the moors and you can smell the heather or you you can smell the earth or you can smell the bracken and I get that fast heartbeat thing. I like <laughs> it's taken it. eight years. I love the landscape now, I love all of it. So do you think that's what Yorkshire's brought you? Absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's very different. Suffolk is very agricultural it's all arable so you know all the land is farmed it's hedgerows managed woodland meadows ploughed fields kind of oilseed rape and cornfields and poppies and you don't get that in Yorkshire the colours are so different and it takes a long time to kind of tune into the palette it's it's staggeringly different here. So your latest project is Lost Houses of the South Pennines. Now tell us a little bit about that and where it all came about and when you first had the idea to do this amazing project. So there's always been this fascination with ruins and with history and with mystery and with things that have been lost and things that have been forgotten. And my granddad, he was an architect. I suppose architectural drawings, draftsman's drawings, those were what decorated his walls and then latterly they've what decorated my parents' walls because Lots of his work have, has come to my parents' house. So that's, that's what I've been exposed to. And when I first moved to Calderdale, having come from Sheffield, um, which was, I mean, it's really quite a modern city. It's beautiful in a different way. Calderdale is full of a, a fairly recent history. It's industrial past that's, that was very fleeting. The ruins of the mills, the shells, the chimneys, they're all still here. And there are people who remember it very differently, you know, 60 years ago when the buildings were all blackened and the air was filthy. So why did you decide to restore the houses back to their original grandeur? Five or six years ago, I was having a conversation with a client about a commission that she wanted. It came up in conversation somewhere called New Crag Hall, which I'd never heard of. And she told me that it was an arts and crafts mansion that had stood for less than 20 years before it burnt down, and there was absolutely nothing left. And I was fascinated by the idea that a house so beautiful could be absolutely gone, but almost be within living memory. That was fascinating to me. And I did go and try and find it, and found not a trace. And then in another conversation, and it was another commission, somebody wanted me to put some small element of somewhere called Castle Car, which again I'd never heard of. And she told me about the water gardens and about the castle and about how short-lived it was but how massive it was and how it stood in moorland and it was miles from anywhere very very isolated very spooky place so it, it was those two houses 
that began a fascination with lost houses locally. And then someone recommended a book called Lost Houses of the West Riding. And this book has possibly about 100. And it's not even, it's not comprehensive in any way. But just flicking through that and realising how many of them were local. And then asking people about some. And it's amazing how some people have never heard of some of them. But then occasionally you stumble across the one person who knows all about one of them. The histories are very tangible in some ways because either the building's demise is in within living memory or local people may have had an, an aunt or a grandmother who were in service in one of these houses. A few of the families have contacted me or people with, um, with a family member who have, may have worked there. One of the ones I've just finished painting... And I think it was the most recently demolished. It came down in the 60s. So lots of people remember it being there as kind of a a grim and blackened house that was just spooky. They all describe it as spooky. And people used the park. The parkland was lovely, but the house was black and gothic and spooky. But people remember, they remember it when it was blown up. They remember the sounds the demolition company knocking it down and then trying to blow it up um, so the town kind of reverberated with the explosions. Other people remember um, soldiers, injured soldiers being cared for in kind of a makeshift hospital there during the Second World War. Other people remember soldiers being billeted there and the damage that they did to the inside of the house. So that one is within living memory and I got an awful lot of little snippets of information. One lady said she remembered going after it had been demolished or whilst it was being demolished, going along with her mum to the building site and there being piles of rubble everywhere, but but, but finding two cherubs' heads. She thinks they were cherubs' heads. She knew they were decorated stones. She thought they were cherubs' heads that were just lying around and her and her mum put them in the pram and carried them home. So goodness knows where these things are now. It's all the little things as well that kind of make up history. And I wonder if there was like an auction. And that's also another kind of possibility to look at as well, isn't it? It is. I mean, it's fascinating to know where some of the bits of the houses ended up. Castle Carr, the contents, I mean, the oak panelling, the stonework from outside, a huge amount of that was auctioned off. So two of the grand fireplaces, one of them's ended up in a home quite near Halifax. One of them's ended up in a restaurant in Bradford. This vast, grotesque stone fountain with four stone hounds has ended up in the business centre in Leeds. And I think it was only quite recently, people only made the connection quite recently as to where it came from. It had just been bought at random from a stonemason's yard back in the 60s or 70s. And recently I went to visit my parents down in Wiltshire. One of their neighbours is a Halifax man born and bred and he showed me in his garden these two beautiful pieces of decorated stone, all bunches of grapes and and roses and leaves that came from his mum's garden in Halifax and they've been rescued from a great house and we don't know which great house it was. But these things lose their provenance so People have no idea where these things have come from. No. But finding the bits for the houses is, is wonderful. It's like treasure hunting. So is, is that why you love doing this project? It's a fascination with um, a sense of history, a sense of place, a sense of atmosphere. The stories for each house have come from a, a, different, a different element of the house. So in some, in some houses it's the house itself... In some, it may be, you know, some great man that lived there and some, you know, great invention that was made in a study, in a tower in the house. There's one called Norland Hall, which it's a, it's a very beautiful Yorkshire manor house, but not remarkable visually. The remarkable thing about it was that it was demolished in 1911 and then crated up and stored and then it was bought by, I'd heard it had been bought by a rich American, ready for shipping to California, to be rebuilt in California. And then when I looked into it, I found out that the rich American was William Randolph Hearst, and the Yorkshire Manor House was meant to be part of Hearst Castle in San Simeon. But there was some argument over customs charges, and the house sat on the docks over in California, and was never rebuilt, and the stone ended up 
used in some Presbyterian church. I don't really have any history of the house, but there's a fascinating story is what, the, what happened to the house after it was demolished in Yorkshire. I love it. I love it because I think the more you go on with this project and the more people bring information, the more you find information, it just evolves. The exhibition's going to start in Halifax and then hopefully it'll go over to Keithley and there are a couple of houses that are in and around Keithley that I will paint for when the exhibition moves there. So the exhibition may kind of develop Evolves as it, as it goes along, as mm. it, yeah, as it tours. Do you have any any favourites that you've already painted already? I love Castle Car. The Castle Car painting is huge because the castle is huge. Everything about it was vast and ugly, and the painting in its way was vast and ugly. It's got this these themes of these Talbot hounds, which were big hunting dogs, and the stonework is. It reminds me of something from Gotham City. It's slightly larger than life. It's not beautiful. It's just, it's vast and it's showy. There's nothing beautiful about the house. The site is grim. The site is desolate. It was misjudged. Once the house was built, nobody wanted to live in it. There were arguments locally over blocked rights of way. The site was plagued by midges. It was cold. It was too isolated for anybody to get to. So as far as a gentleman's residence for hunting parties and house parties, it never really came to anything because nobody wanted to go there. Nobody wanted to be there. Nobody wanted to live in it. It sounds really sad. It is really sad. And there's also, <laughs> I mean, also, places get a dark reputation, but, you know, tragedy befell the man who commissioned the house. Him and his eldest son were killed in a hideous train accident before it was even completed. And then I think disaster befell the family who owned it after them. Um, their eldest son died after inhaling lead paint fumes somewhere. It just seemed to have bad luck attached to it. In a way, the house haunted my dreams. And it was quite nice to paint another slightly more cheerful one after painting <laughs> that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, when, we, when you first started with the project, we did say there's probably going to be a few nightmares. Just because I think the nature of old houses and, and their stories, and the time as well, the time of, of history, and yeah. there's, there's a lot more tragedy. So what's your other favourite? My current favourite is the one that I'm about to paint, which is Oakworth House. It was built in 1874 for a, a gentleman called Sir Isaac Holden, who's a fascinating character, and he... He was a great believer in, in healthy living at a time when nobody really was. And he had huge theories on, um, on bathing and about the temperature of the water and the temperature of the body. He was a great believer in healthy eating. So bearing in mind, suddenly with the developments of um, the production of glass, so that Paxton built the Crystal Palace mm. in 1850... So suddenly glass was much more readily available. So glass houses were something that every grand house could suddenly have available to them. It was, kind of, it was affordable and they became showpieces. Isaac Holden built huge glass houses and winter gardens and he had an orchid house, a rose house, a peach house, a fig house. So he could grow fruit for his household, flowers for his household, flowers for neighbouring households. He had a Turkish bath, and the Turkish bath building had a separate room for shampooing in. I want the... to live there. <laughs> well, you can't, because it burnt down, despite having the first ever sprinkler system. These houses were among the first buildings to have, you know, electricity and gas. This house had its own, own furnace in the basement, so it could generate its own power. It had... They had... Yeah, central heating and air conditioning. So the house was supposed to be a constant temperature all the time. All the bedrooms had their own bathrooms. All the bathrooms were, you know, white marble and had silver plated fixtures. You know, it was, money was no object. I don't think taste was a great object either. It was all about show. And it, you know, within, well, less than 100 years, it had all been pulled down because nobody could afford to live like that. I suppose, post-war. But it was ahead of its time, though. It was ahead of its time, but a house like that involved an awful lot of staff. 
people weren't prepared to go into service. He's a fascinating man. I just think it's fascinating. I think the more you find out about this exhibition and the content of this exhibition is fascinating. But let's get onto the paintings. Okay. Because I've seen previews of some of the paintings and I can only describe them as absolutely stunning. Thank you. The, the restoration work that you've done is just, even if maybe certain people at the time thought there were certain buildings were ugly, you made them beautiful. Tell us why you've used quite a lot of warm, autonomous colours in certain kind of paintings. Well, in some of them I have. The, the important thing for me was where records exist for these houses. The photographs are generally black and white, if there are photographs at all. Sometimes there are kind of architectural elevations, sometimes there are ground plans. But there's certainly nothing in colour, so they're quite drab, quite glib. They have no atmosphere to them. And the important thing for me was to really bring them to life. And the only way I know how to do that is just film with colour. So some, for some reason, some of the houses to me felt very warm. Some have felt kind of desolate and isolated and cold. And it's often to do with... I've, I've visited the site of everyone I've painted so far, so I have a sense of the whether it's a very exposed site, whether, it, whether the wind blows across the moors, whether it's kind of in quite formal parkland where, you know, they get nice autumnal light. I have a kind of a sense of place for each of them. And Manor Heath, for me, even though all the photographs I've seen and the descriptions that people have given me, bearing in mind that the descriptions from people now, the only thing they remember is the house as being very blackened and very gothic. But that house had been... A, nobody had lived in it for quite some time, so it, it would have looked spooky because it was empty. But the descriptions of the house when it was newly finished are very different. And my experience of that park, because it's a lovely park and I go with my children there a lot, it's a very sunny place, it's got huge well-established trees that are very beautiful in the autumn. It's a park that we tend to go kind of in the winter to catch the sun. So to me it's a very happy place. So the paintings I've done are full of warmth and, and kind of autumn light. And the stone, you can feel the heat coming off the stone in that one. Stunning, absolutely stunning. But they have to be seen. So tell us when the exhibition is. The exhibition begins in January next year, 2016. And I really wanted to have it in January because it's such a cold time of year, post-Christmas. I, I really like the idea of having something to look forward to in January. Fantastic. Oh, well, thank you very much. We look forward to the exhibition. On the 23rd of January, 2016, at Bankfield Museum in Halifax. If you would like to know more about Kate Lysett and her work, please go to www.katelysett.co.uk. Thank you for listening.